This is the Mindset Game Podcast, and I'm your host, James Roberts. And on today's show, I've got Dan Haycock. Dan is a Paralympian from London 2012, but he also runs his own business and recently uh, launched his book, Zero Resistance Training. So welcome onto the show, Dan. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So before we delve into today's episode, Dan, can we talk about your journey, obviously, from going back to the very beginning to where you are now in your in your fitness life god um i'm gonna need to condense this down because it's a it's a long long story uh many many bumps in the road um a lot of bad things have happened i've been through um but essentially i had a motorbike accident when i was five years old i got told i would never walk again um, left me hospitalized for months and months and months. And um, I basically uh, was the fat kid in the wheelchair that never went out the house, was sat inside playing computer games, um, went to high school. Uh, I went through bullying and all this type of stuff as well. Um, I went to high school and I, I was, you know, in the P classes, just sat in a classroom why everybody else was playing football, rugby or whatever it was on that particular day. And, you know, I just thought that was, that, that was normal to me. I wasn't sad. I wasn't, it was just, it, it just was what it was. Um, and one day we got a new PE teacher that was a, a basketball fan. And he told me that I could play basketball in a wheelchair. And I was just like, okay, like just right over my head. I didn't think anything more of it. And then, um, a couple of weeks later, he, he gave me some contact details. So thankfully, the guy had gone out and um, sourced the, the local team, got contact details, set them up. Um, and I went along with my my, uh, my grandfather one Thursday night in Liverpool. Um, I was absolutely gobsmacked by the sport and how what I had in my head, the picture of what it was going to be like and what it actually was like. And this is going back... Uh, 23 years so it's a long long time ago uh, and yeah I just fell in love with the sport and they, they included me in the first session albeit for 15-20 minutes and then went back the next week and it just progressed from there to um, to now where I am uh, I was going once a week back then now I'm a, I'm a pro pro player in the Spanish league um, I train probably five, six hours a day in season, um, five days a week, uh, play on a weekend. Um, I don't play internationally anymore. I, I finished that a couple of years ago, but um, I've been all over the world playing. There's not many, play, not many countries that I haven't been. I've competed in three world championships, one Paralympics, uh, three European championships. Um, I represented the, the Great Britain junior team. And... Now my, my life is turning a different way and um, I've got my own business, I'm an online um, personal trainer and nutrition coach and um, that's working really well alongside my, my sport and eventually I will be just transitioning directly out of sport and concentrating on this uh, full time 100%. Um, so I mean, yeah, that, that's it in a nutshell, there's been a lot of ups, a lot of downs, um, I've been through a lot of personal uh, issues along the way but um, you know, you, you keep on fighting the fight and eventually you get to where you want to be. Um, I'm just happy and grateful that I uh, stuck to it and never lost vision of what I was wanting to achieve. And Dan, if we're going to go back to your experience of PE as a youngster, mm -hmm. do you kind of think that even this day and age, um, kids that have got a disability are somewhat excluded because the teachers can't think out of the outside of a box. Absolutely. I mean, back, back then, I mean, when, when I had my accident, uh, the authorities wanted to send me to a special school because I was in a wheelchair. Like that was it. You're in a wheelchair, you go into a special school. Granted, this was a long time ago and things have changed a lot then, but I think the mentality with a lot of people still is, isn't where it should be in, in, in this type of scenario. Um, yeah, I mean, what, once I got active in PE classes and I started doing a little bit of basketball, then the teachers started thinking of things that I could do, such as 
you know, badminton and things like this, and you know, where I could move a little bit and get involved in certain things. Um, I, I, I don't honestly know how it is now at school, um, but I would imagine there's a lot of, um, you know, courses that, that these, these guys go on to, uh, inclusion courses, I think they're called, um, and, you know, you, there's workarounds on including people with all sorts of disabilities, learning disabilities and all these type of things to include them in, as much as possible in, into regular activities and regular, uh, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for, but you, you get what I'm trying to say. And if we kind of go back to your first impression of wheelchair basketball, what, if you can recollect, what did you kind of have in your mind as to what the sport was going to be as opposed to when you turned up? Uh, well, all I know is I, I, I was, my, my wheelchair was this fucking big, ugly hospital thing uh, that weighed a ton. Uh, and <laughs> I remember I was like pushing up and down the corridor at school and I, my first thought was, I can't, I can't imagine pushing this as fast as I can, like <laughs> you know, for two hours. Uh, and then when I got there and realized that all the, the, the basketball chairs that people had were all made to measure. And like I say, going back 23 years, they were still super, they looked super cool. Uh, they, you know, if, if we look at compared to what they're, they're, they're like now, they look terrible. But back then, in comparison to the big hospital wheelchair, they looked amazing. And they were so much lighter and they were made to measure each person. Um, they were still very, very expensive back then. Um, but I just remember seeing 10, 12 players whizzing up and down the court, um, scoring, uh, shooting the ball from all over, scoring. The skill level was um, ridiculous. Uh, I wasn't expecting it to be like that. Um, I, I think I, I almost felt, sad to say this, but I almost felt embarrassed when I was going there because I... I would wonder what people would think about me and stuff. And I, 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 again, I think this is just a mentality thing, you know. Um, and until our eyes are opened with various things, then you, you just never know. And if we kind of move to the present day, <coughs> and we come to your book, uh, Zero Resistance Training, what kind of brought that about? Okay, so um, I, I was getting um, more and more clients into my training and nutrition programs that were wheelchair bound or had disability of some sort. Um, uh, obviously, because I'm in the disabled community being a wheelchair basketball player, um, and I was making these plans and uh, the, the same sort of problems were cropping up all the time, whereas you know, if somebody's training partner couldn't, uh, didn't turn up, then uh, the guys couldn't do certain things like put, loading plates onto a bench press, for example, or um, transferring from um, uh, the chair to a machine. Or maybe the guys didn't like transferring from a chair to machine to machine and felt a bit self-conscious about doing it. Um, and, and then, you know, if there was no member of staff there to help, then they were basically bollocks. They couldn't complete the workouts. And I thought, you know, this is this is not good. Like, how can we? fix this and I, I don't know my first thought was to build a complete training system using variety of exercises training methods um etc etc that almost any wheelchair can perform any wheelchair user can perform uh, without the aid of anybody else using only uh three or four pieces of equipment um, and without the need to transfer out of the wheelchair um and my first intent was to release it as an ebook. Um, I didn't have a frigging clue how to like do it. I was terrible at English at school. Um, I didn't know where to start. So my first port call was to research how to write an ebook. Uh, I got a structure, um, mapped it out. I actually bought another ebook um, to see how it was structured in terms of you know a forward introduction glossary main content that type of thing uh give give myself a lot of subheaders and then uh built my program into it um, and then really filled it out with with more content uh, more um uh again the word fails me i can't can't seem to think of it 
Um, but yeah, I, I did that and then um, I got told that it could actually be a book um, and, it, and a, a Kindle type book. Um, I got the help of somebody. They helped me put it all together, make it look professional. Uh, really, really pleased with the output. And uh, yeah, I, I didn't think that it would, um, in the first day, reach a number one spot on Amazon. Only for one day, but it still got there. Um, and it's still uh, continuing to serve people um, and help people all over the world at the moment. So something I'm very, very proud of. Um, and I'm really glad that uh, when I had that, and it was just a flash in the pound thought in my head. Um, I'm sure you get a lot of these, and uh, if you're anything like me, they, they go into your head and soon it's that you, you forgot about it. And with, with this, it just seems to stick. And I just uh, took action on it straight away. And, and once I started, then... That was it. It was there in my head and I was thinking about it. And I, I did about 80% of the book in about a week, a week, seven to 10 days. Uh, it took me and then I put it down and didn't touch it for months and months and months. And then it was one of those things that was always, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And it never got done. And so I just had to pull my finger out and get, get it sorted. And we kind of touched on like the training aspects of, of things, Dan. Do you believe and this is probably a PC question now, that when a gym says they are accessible, yeah. obviously they don't talk about the actual gym floor. What's your take yeah. on that? I, I think basically when it says it's accessible, in terms of the gym, I would, I would imagine in, from their point of view, that means they can get into the, into the gym either by a ramp, maybe it has a lift if there's two floors, and they have a disabled uh, changing room. Now, there's been a pl plenty of gyms that I've been in and um, everything's so tightly packed together. It's a fucking nightmare for any wheelchair user to get down, uh, to get past benches, to get free weights, to, um, you know, to maybe go on a, a plate loading machine and load plates on that the, are the too close to each other. Um, and I actually know a lot of people that uh, are wheelchair users that um, their local gyms just won't allow them in there. They're, they're not, they're not, uh, they're not insured, or they come up with all sorts of bullshit excuses. But it makes my piss for us. And you know, if somebody wants to get healthy, and and you know, you the, there's all these roadblocks there in front of them. Like, what what what's somebody supposed to do? It's it's not on in my book. Um, you know, everybody should have the same same right to uh to improve the health would you say go even as far as say it's a, a form of exclusion yeah yeah i i, I would to an extent and, and i and let me just elaborate on that as well there's a lot of um there's a lot of trainers out there as well and, and this is nothing bad on their behalf i think it's just um it's the land of the unknown and they maybe worried that, about taking on a, a, a wheelchair using clients or the, the worried that they might not be able to do something or I don't know, but it's just, a, it's like, you no, know, uh, uh, you know, they don't want to work with them. And it's not, I don't mean that in a bad sense, like they don't like them. I think it's just, they, they're thinking, how the fuck do I handle the situation? What can I do? You know, and, uh, again, there needs to be more more stuff out there to educate people on on this matter, so that everybody can uh, have a fair crack of the whip at getting fit, getting healthy, and that type of thing. But if we talk about it, people in terms of say the personal trainers, you would have thought, and I don't want to generalise here. Obviously, a trainer has learned their skill. Yeah. And the ones that are able to adapt should look at it in that same way. It's a, the disabled individual is no different from, say, Joe Bloggs on the street because you're not going to, yes. in yes. theory, uh, I, yeah. have the same off-the-shelf program for everybody. So you should think of it in that yeah. way. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm going to slag the fitness industry off uh, here by saying this, and it will upset a lot of people, but... Uh, the, for me, trainers fall into two, two, two camps at the moment. There are people that go and do 
the, the short courses and get um, get qualified and they can go and start working in the gym and they you know a couple of months previous they've never done anything like this before and they're now a trainer in charge of somebody's health and fitness because the bar is set so low with a lot of governing bodies shall I say um, to get the qualification and then there's uh, there's people like yourself that's got a fucking degree in the sports science and there's other trainers that are looking to continually improve, doing courses, going to seminars, keeping up to date with everything. Um, and it's, uh, it's a real passion for helping people. And, um, and I, I think the, the, the people that fall in the first camp that aren't experienced and are not, uh, they're, they're, the, they're the type of people that will be scared of working with a, a disabled client because um, they're, they're just not educated enough, they're not uh, experienced enough. Um, and I, I think it's something that uh, I don't know how it would be addressed, but uh, I, I, I know for sure in the, the last five years, the amount of personal trainers you see is just, yeah, it's just going higher and higher. Um, and you know, those that are working on the gym floor are reducing prices so much because there's so much competition and uh, there's not really anything to set them apart um, because the, the majority of people go through the same the same accreditation type progress uh, process sorry um, and for me it's not uh, it's not it's not good enough I think the industry needs to be to be uh, to a higher standard would you say then that, and I've spoken to another trainer about this not on the on the podcast, but in the past, would you believe that following the Australian model, and I think it's they've got to do it over a couple of years before they can get certified. Would you think that would be a better model for be implemented in the UK? Uh, I I think it has plus points, um, and also. Um, I don't. I, I don't really know too much about the Australian system. I think it sorts out the the people that really want to do it, because obviously the, there's a massive time commitment as opposed to going on a twelve week course and being qualified in twelve weeks, going from maybe never even stepping foot in, in, in a gym before to being a qualified PT in twelve weeks, uh, to um, having that as a, a burning ambition as, as a career and going doing two or three years and studying for it. Um, but on the other hand, if it was, uh, if there was a system where people can get an initial qualification as quick as they do, but there's got to be some kind of, time, uh, some kind of continuous uh, learning cycle that they go on to, to keep learning because you can't, in my opinion, you, you can't or you shouldn't be allowed to take care of somebody's health fitness in 12 weeks if you've gone from nothing before it's too short a time um that's that's my opinion um if you've never had any uh, experience doing anything else beforehand if you completely knew so i think that i don't know how they would uh, implement such a system but I, I think there should be some kind of uh maybe you you've you got to sit an exam every year or you've got to go and do some courses every year to keep up to date with everything that's involved in training and nutrition. I, d I don't know, but um, I think things could definitely be improved. But if you talk about the exam, Dan, if we just talk about from the nutrition side of things, it is so basic. Yeah. It's, well, you could say quite horrifying in, <laughs> in a way that yeah. you are taught. And if I use my course as the example, it wasn't even up to date in terms of, what was it? Like saturated fat was looked upon negatively. Yeah. Of, uh, I can't remember what it was in terms of it actually is something yeah. else. That's the, the well, I mean, th th there's a couple of great courses out there at the moment. There's, um, there's three that I could recommend straight away. There's uh, uh, the Shredded by Science course. Um, there's uh, a course by Martin McDonald called the MNU University. Um, and there's another course called the, uh, it, I can't remember what it's called, but it's by a guy called Phil Learning. Um, 
everything is is bang up to date uh, with all the, the newest research, the, the journals, the research papers, um, and you, you're learning the most current stuff. Um, you know, if you go if you go and do one of these other courses, you, you, you're reading stuff that's been wiped. You know, we wiped the floor with them like years ago, and that's what people. Are, um, that's why there's so much misinformation uh, because people are, uh, are learning this stuff and it's not it's not correct. And they're they're, uh, they're verbalizing, they're vocalizing their knowledge, but their knowledge is is five years old, for, for instance. In, in some cases so yeah it, it, it needs to be sort of a level playing field and everybody needs to be on the same page but I think you probably could go one step further obviously you talked about obviously that um, <coughs> obviously wanting to improve yourself year on year or even you probably could dense that from a goal for goal setting perspective as a little bit like short term long term um, yeah. and medium you obviously want to better yourself you could probably say and this is something we've talked about off air numerous times about using the likes of social media probably twitter probably is a better one because yeah. you've got that engagement with inf influential people a little bit easier than say yes facebook yeah of course of course um and, and again you you have uh social media is is uh is both a fantastic and uh, dangerous thing in terms of the, the fitness industry because you you have one camp uh, trying to uh, work with integrity and trying to work in a manner that is helping people and trying to diminish this other camp that are self-righteous fucking assholes that um, have built up a following and don't know their ass from their elbow. Uh, they might be in good, good physical condition, and people will always confuse that with no, them knowing what they're on about, and they use that uh, that position that they have to um, not only make a lot of money, but to uh, you know, spread in a lot of shit about what's the best thing to do, and and in some cases, uh, the the stuff that they're they're saying is that the the thing to do is it can be dangerous. So. But I think I think with that, and I've touched upon this quite a few times within the podcast, it's probably in terms of looking at it from a nutritional perspective and your health, he's probably at times questioning things, have that red flag come out when it's, it's it I don't know, it doesn't quite resonate in terms of it doesn't feel right with in your gut. Well yeah. that's probably your body telling you, well, there is something not quite right. Maybe you should delve into it a little bit deeper and see, well, yeah. these are the pros. Well, what are the cons that you're hiding from me? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I always say to people, um, you can spot somebody that's full of bullshit because, um, you know, if you ask somebody a question, oh, uh, think to yourself how many times a certain person has said, uh, I don't know. I mean, if there's, if there's a million and one things I don't know, uh, and I'm more than happy to say that and be honest. And maybe I can go find out for you if you want me to. But somebody that says they know everything or have an answer for everything, that's a red flag. Um, uh, another one, if you, if you ask your coach or somebody that has this position of authority as a trainer um, a question, and they uh, knock you back down by saying, just do as I say, sort of thing, and they can't answer the question. Um, the you know, it, the, there's a red flag there that says you know they're copying somebody else, or they they don't really understand what they're, they're trying to teach. Um, you know, I, I encourage everybody to ask questions, uh, and you know, if, if something's wrong, you're just you not. Know, level of trust and there's got to be a level of trust for you to work effectively as clients and trainer and if we kind of go on to obviously your basketball career and mm -hmm. obviously trying to balance that with the PT side of things do you think obviously if we harpen back to your elite side of sport do you think you have learned 
some of your craft from the strength and conditioning coaches, nutritionists that you've happened to work with? Um, in terms the, the nutritionist side, yeah, not so much. I always found them to be a little bit dated, I, I, and that's, that's the God's honest truth. The s and coaches I've worked with have been phenomenal. Um, I've learned a hell of a lot of those, off those, over the, over the years. Um, and especially when, it's, when it comes to doing something that's sport specific um, or looking at building strength, for example. Um, yeah, I, I learned a lot working with those guys. Um, you know, a, a massive part of my learning as well was also hiring some of the best nutrition guys or the best trainers in the world to work with, to then learn from as well as doing my own learning as well. Um, you know, sort of just being a sponge, taking um, everything that uh, I could from everybody that I've worked with and, and whatnot. So I think it's it's really important to, to be able to do that. And, you know, uh, anybody that works with a coach, I encourage ask questions, ask questions because when you understand something, it makes doing it that much easier. And in terms of like, when you say sport specific training, are you better able to obviously well from a training perspective from a personal trainer obviously we talk about periodization do you think you're better uh, how would I put it at the word that I want uh, at understanding and portraying uh, how you want the training to come across but say if there's somebody's asking you questions well why are we doing it this way do you think you are yeah. better at explaining? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, cards on the table. In terms of the strength conditioning, I'm looking at uh, maybe a year's long plan with specific dates and uh, periodizing certain phases. Uh, you know, that's not my area of speciality, although I, I am competent at doing that. Um, my, my area of speciality is fat loss and metabolism building. Um, it's the area that I like working in most and it's the area that I've learned the most in. Um, so it makes sense that that's the, the avenue I go down. Um, but yeah, you know, when if, for example, I'm working with a wheelchair basketball player and uh, they play at a high level and they have the pre-season, they have um, the lead up to Christmas and then after Christmas is when uh, European Cup preliminaries, finals, league finals, cup finals come in. Um, I'm very competent and able to periodize their training in a way where they're um, going to go through a period of overreaching at the start, building strength, conditioning levels, um, winding it down before important dates. So they're going to be arriving on the basketball court um, as fresh as possible whilst having gained the benefit of the body's recovered and gained the benefit from all the hard work they've done in previous months. I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> That's quite I do it all the time, don't worry. No, but it's in terms of, I had a question in mind and I was listening to your answer and I can't remember the question. Um, what was it? Oh, what was it in terms of, I'll have to come back to that one. That's happened, that, that hasn't happened for a long, long time on the show. Um, <laughs> in terms of, oh, what was it about? I'll have to come back to that. Um, come blank completely but in terms of there you go it's come back to me now when you say metabolism I'm obviously working with multiple clients now what is your take on oh, this is probably a big one at the at the moment between obviously flexible dieting and you know like with bro science um the what I want you know like clean eating and, you know okay like, you eat, yeah you know. well I mean um, what, my, my take on it is this I will always um, encourage a flexible dieting protocol where people will track macros and hit specific daily targets um, that just gives them more flexibility and they can make their own choices and they can have a life as well as achieving the goals there's no I set meal plans no, uh, they can go out and have a drink they can do whatever they like uh, um, and I always say, think of the 80-20 rule when you're doing this. If you 
you know, choosing nutrient dense foods 80% of the time, you can fill them with the 20% how you see fit. Um, but the fact of the matter is, it's not for everybody. Um, some people need to have it rigid and because they, when, when they have a choice, uh, everything goes to pot. Um, and I've worked with numerous people like this and it, it, it just comes down to the fact that they, they need a, a rigid meal plan and they don't want to have to think about planning and uh, tracking and scanning foods with an app and things like this. So although I always encourage to go down the flexible dieting route and some people need a meal plan. Other people just need to have simple guidelines when it comes to fat loss and some very uh, simple tips to help them um, stay in a uh, calorie deficit so they're going to you know, be continually losing weight. Um, some people travel about quite a lot and maybe can't get to the gym for six, seven days in a row. That's something you've just got to work with um, and find a way around and you've got to build. For me, you've got to build a plan that fits each person's circumstances, fits in with their work life, their family life, their social life, and um, when that can fit in with how they do things, they're going to be able to sit to it and have a uh, have a more sustainable plan, which is going to lead to shit on more consistency, which then equals um, results. And obviously, we've talked about there's a lot of air in the past. How come you kind of found yourself to be, we use the analogy, one side of the fence as opposed to others? Because I know speaking to you personally, mm -hmm. you're obviously a massive hater of meal prep. But can you explain to the listeners how you kind of, kind um, of one side of the fence to the other, as yeah. opposed to the other? I mean, I mean I, I'm, I'm just a, a believer that you, you don't have to sacrifice everything in your life to achieve uh, the body that you want. You just don't have to do it. And I even know that because I've been through the process of doing this and, and getting to a, into a condition where I was super, super happy with low body fat, um, muscular. Uh, and I did that whilst eating everything that I wanted. Yeah, there was periods of times where I would have, have to go without a little bit and not have as much. But generally, I, I did what I want. And, I thought, why would anybody want to do this? Because you see so many people that are dieting and cutting calories and it's just miserable spots all the time. <laughs> uh, it, but again, it's, you know, it, it's a choice that people make and some people prefer to be like that. And, uh, it's, you know, it's not for me. And some people uh, prefer to do a week's meal prep or three days meal prep uh, once or twice a week. Again, that's not for me. I, I just eat as I see fit and track macros. Uh, I usually plan the night before what I'm going to have the next day, pour it into my app, and then I know what I'm going to be eating the next day. I don't necessarily prep it, but I know what I'm going to be eating. And if we kind of go now to like your aspirations going forward, Dan, where do you kind of see yourself? Oh, and this is the kind of a question I hate like from a job perspective. Where do you kind of see yourself maybe in the next five to ten years? On a boat, sipping cocktail. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I, I just want to continue to build my business, build my brand. In, in terms of business and the, and the training aspects, I want to keep building the business, building the brand. And I want to look at um, building that brand out in terms of having people jump on board and, and having other trainers work within the brand. Um, and I want to have a real focus on helping uh, the disabled community all over the world because I think it's uh, what's out there for, for for these guys at the moment is absolute shit and I think somebody needs to to step up and do something about it and it's uh, you know why not me that's what um, I think. Um, you bring up a good point there Dan in terms of well you use that one the, the analogy I want to sit on a boat yeah. obviously from a social media perspective and probably more so <laughs> faith Facebook. I know, I, I, know, I know where you're going with this. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it, 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 yeah, are you talking about the smoke and mirrors effect? Yeah. Of, yeah. Yeah, based, yeah. We all know that social media is just a fucking highlight reel and there's not me uh, um, say how it is or, uh, you know, show the, the, the shitty stuff as well as the, 
the good stuff. Um, it, that just portrays and, and leads people to think that the where they want to be is unattainable. Uh, you know, you see these people that are in fantastic shape all year round. The fact is that they get uh, 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 you know a load of photos done in different locations over a period of a month or two, and then they drip feed these on social media, giving the effect that they're all over the world uh, having photos took with Ferraris and looking fantastic. It's just a load of bullshit in 99% of, the, excuse me, of cases, um, you know, and, and this just makes people get down on themselves thinking they can't have that body. Why can't I do that? I'm not good enough. I'll never be good enough. So that, this is another mentality that we need to get rid of. And then the one you didn't touch upon, you know, the, the, from the kind of all the fitness side of things and the probably the professional <laughs> Obviously, you know the ones with the talking about six was it six figure incomes? Oh yeah, uh, yeah. I mean that this is for a lot of personal trainers and something I've been um, been through, and it's you know, I, and there's a lot of people trying to help people on social media, uh, personal trainers, uh, any any type of coach really that. Um, and you go through these programs, you pay a lot of money to go through them, and they they bullshit you and say in the next thirty days you could be making X amount of money. Usually, it's a six figure uh, fit pro type plan, which means you're going to be making ten grand plus a month. Um, and I, I've been through those myself, and it's at the start it was it was good, it was good. But I think when I started to used those processes. It was at the end of a cycle where the whole world was wise to um, what was going on. Um, and yeah, I, I think a lot of personal trainers need to be wary of um, these type of people that are asking, you know, upwards of 10 grand to, to work with them and basically giving them uh, bullshit. You know, uh, you, you're looking at uh, 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 bog standard uh, Facebook, uh, sorry, Facebook course, or a, a website where you go through uh, a number of lessons. Um, but basically, they're, they're absolutely terrible. Um, I recommend that if anybody is looking to, um, uh, or any personal trainers that are looking to develop their career, especially online, there's a guy called Sucksa who you need to speak to. Um, he is by far. Uh, the best guy that I've ever worked with and uh, his prices had nowhere near uh, £10,000 so um, but yeah and another thing these guys do is they, they encourage you to uh, they make you feel basically the, the, sale, the, 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 the salesman basically uh, and they, they spread a lot of lies um, in order to, to gain money so but does that, Dan, if we kind of happen back to the, kind of your point in the, earlier in the episode, with obviously people not being as experienced, not uh, possibly ever done anything remotely similar in their lives, mm -hmm. do you think then they kind of have, and I won't generalize just to them, you probably could put it across the spectrum, do you think people have kind of blinkers on and are solely looking at, well, okay, this person is going to get me to six figures in the shortest period of time, and they're only looking at the end goal of obviously that income. Yeah, absolutely, and that, that's that's the that's what I fell into. It's funny though because when you think about it, as a personal trainer, if your client wanted to get to a certain physique in thirty days, to be like. It's not going to happen. Like you need to be, you need to work hard. You need to be consistent. You need to be patient. That's what we would tell a client. In essence, that that's what we should tell ourselves. in, in terms of the the business, and yeah, it's, it's something that um, I I really had the shock of my life because first three or four months of doing what I was doing uh, went really really well, and then all of a sudden, everything that I was doing was not working anymore. And, Slowly, slowly, uh, clients are going one by one. 
Uh, it's only when I really uh, rejig my whole business model and start to uh, get help of somebody that actually knew what they were talking about and have been through it um, in terms of, uh, of the business model. Um, that's when things really, really picked up for me. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just uh, grateful that I, I got put in contact with this guy. But I've been doing research and, you know, looking back a couple of years, the people that were doing, <coughs> excuse me, these six-figure FitPro courses at the start, they were, they were making a ridiculous amount of money. And it's it <coughs> basically, you know, since people are true, it usually is. And it has a shelf life, and it was a relatively short one. <coughs> so in terms of the business aspect, it's exactly as you would sell a client. You need to find something that is sustainable, that gives you a level of consistency where you can work and gives you a level of consistency where you can um, take, a, take a wage on a consistent basis. As opposed to- and last question, Dan, before we wrap up the episode. If you had to summarize this entire show that we've done today into one sentence for somebody to take away, what would that be? It, it, that's simple. Um, I, I think what I mentioned in terms of the basketball journey and the, the business is um, have a clear goal in mind, have a, a reason why you want to achieve that goal, and stay the course. You know, it, it's never going to be constant improvement week by week. You know, if you're looking to lose fat, it's never going to be constant fat loss week by week. It just doesn't work that way. If you're um, in business, you're never going to be constantly earning more and more money every month. It doesn't work that way. You've just got to keep working hard, keep showing up uh, every day, keep doing what you're, you're good at, keep doing things to the best of your ability, uh, be a good fucking person, and be consistent and be persistent. And it will take time. Some people will take less time than others. That's just the way life is. Uh, but if you, uh, you know, stay focused, you'll go with whatever you want to achieve. You just got to be persistent. Stay focused. I think that's some wise words to live by, Dan. So once again, Dan, thanks for coming on the Mindset Game podcast. It was a pleasure, mate. Thank you for having me. Likewise.